I have a question. If you would uh, clarify what you mean by high culture. <laughs> <laughs> Autobiografie, sondern so etwas wie ein Analogrechner für Sie zu sein. Wie, wie, kam, wie kommt man zur Medienwissenschaft, wie kommt man zur Mediengeschichte, wie entsteht überhaupt dieses Projekt, das ja vor 40 Jahren als, oder 50 Jahren, als die Dialektik der Aufklärung erschien, noch völlig undenkbar war. Wovon ich immer träume und was die Leute nicht hören wollen, weil sie immer glauben, dass die Technik und die Wissenschaft äh, nur Werkzeug ist für für die Leute auf der Straße gemacht, was ein lächerliches Gerücht ist, aber den Leuten halt offenbar in der Schule immer weiß gemacht wird, damit sie das aushalten, ihre Technisierung und die Technisierung der Räume, in denen wir uns durchschlagen müssen. Also wovon ich dagegen träume, ist, dass die Maschinen, vor allem die jetzigen die intelligenten Maschinen, seit einen Turing sind 1936 im Geist erfunden hat, dass die gar nicht für uns Menschen so sehr sind, wir sind viel zu grob sozusagen, gebaut sondern dass sich da die Natur, dieser, dieser leuchtende, erkennende Teil der Natur mit sich selbst rückkoppelt. Computer werden deshalb immer schneller als Maschinen, nicht als Software, weil jeder Fortschritt in der Computertechnologie es erlaubt, feinere Strukturen in der Materie festzustellen, kristalline Strukturen, Quantenstrukturen. Mit Computern erforschen wir auf der kleinsten denkbaren Ebene, auf der Ebene, wo Heisenberg physikalisch eins ankam, die, die Natur. Und die Natur sagt wieder diesen Festkörperphysikern, die das machen, wie sie ihre Computer noch kleiner und eleganter und schneller machen können. Und dann bauen die, entstehen neue, schnelle Computer, die, die tauchen wieder tief in, tiefer in die dunkle Materie ein und finden dort noch mehr. Und diese Rückkopplungsschleife erlaubt es zum Beispiel, dass unsere Kultur die einzige ist, die weiß, ob am Wochenende die Sonne scheint oder nicht mit 95% oder 90% Wahrscheinlichkeit. Alle anderen Kulturen mussten die Götter, die Wettergötter dafür anrufen. Computer möchte mit Computer kommunizieren. Und Informationshunger. Ja, und all diese... Faustisches Begehren <lacht> ja, steckt eigentlich in diesen kleinen Chips. Ja, ja. Sind neugierig. Und all diese netten kleinen... Literaturhäuser in Deutschland und anderswo, die dann Veranstaltungen machen, was jetzt das Internet wohl für die Literatur bringt, sind einfach Placebo-Pillen. Das heißt, also weil, nicht, weil, eben, weil, weil das Netz dazu da ist, dass Computer mit Computer verschaltet werden, an denen auch Tastaturen und Benutzer angeschlossen sein können, aber nicht müssen. In der Annahme, dass Sie neugierig sind auf Fakten und Daten, habe ich versucht zu tun, was ich konnte und ein Potpourri geschrieben, das ein bisschen chaotisch ist, weil es schwer ist, all diese vielen Aspekte der Technologie und der dahinterstehenden Ästhetik vielleicht oder oder, Natur, oder dem dahinterstehenden Bild von Natur mh, gerecht zu werden. Und ich glaube, deshalb sind wir so gut positioniert zwischen den Jahrmillionen der Evolution der Biologie und den 18 Monaten der Computerei, dass wir ungefähr in 10, 20 Jahren und wenn es gut geht mit einer Magisterarbeit oder Dissertation äh, das Wissen der letzten drei Jahrtausende so wesentlich rekapitulieren, rekursiv. Das wünsche ich Ihnen allen, dass es gelingt. Wer reitet so spät? Wer reitet so spät? Who rides so late, so late? 
Who writes so late, bereitet so spät durch Nacht und Wind? Who writes into the night's wind? What writes into the night's wind? The wind, the wind, the winny, the ween, the wind, 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 rewind, unwind, rewind, the breeze, the breeze, the breeze, the good breast, the breath, the breath, the good breast, the breeze, the breeze, the breath. Despite it all, Friedrich Kittler was the good breast of Germanistic. had hitherto been impossible. Hegel had referred to the sound as a, a disappearing, disappearing of, of being in the, the act, act of being. being. Subsequently, celebrating it as a saturated expression of the manifestation of ingredients. What was impossible to store could not be manipulated. When storage and manipulation coincide in principle, Thinking, pornography, and memory may be insufficient. Storage facilities which are capable of altering the character of sounds, thanks to time manipulation, shatter the very concept of memory. But it is a term of his to make no sound, to pick your feet up off the ground, and to listen to the sound. We all do it when we switch on the music that commands such magic. More precise than poetic imagination. Technology literally makes the unheard of possible. Respiration. Aspiration. Inspiration. Expiration. Barely. A. Breath. Calm. Einen Hauk. Spürest du. Die deutsche Literatur hebt an mit einem Seufzer. Ah. <laughs> Friedrich, the breathtaking, often traveled zones where, or perhaps when, following his tempo, breath was at issue. 
sometimes heaving, but oftentimes barely trackable. Still, other times in your face. Der Atem, mein großes Lebensthema. In a different way than we knew through Hölderlin's wind poems, Bettina, Bettina, she wrote into the wind, following very special velocities of saying to which Friedrich attuned us. Friedrich breathed life into the most moribund zones of scholarship. Yes, scholarship. scholarship for which he was considered at times the kiss of death. But he delivered his kiss more like the prince prodding Snow White out of a toxic slumber. If we are moved to open the scene of commemorative writing with the accent on music, and perhaps even with somewhat of a French accent, may we, oui, may we, oui, these accent marks come from Friedrich himself. Friedrich Kittler magnetized accents and dents and static and noise and scratches and foreign phantoms that he implanted on the soil of Germanicity, ever practicing a politics of contamination. Shortly, we shall see how Friedrich became Greek and crashed against the walls of incorporated intrusion. The first time I heard Friedrich live, up close and personal, it was one summer in Strasbourg, a colloquium organized by Philippe Lacoulabart and Jean-Luc Nancy. This was my Woodstock, my private screening and life-spanning sneak preview, my very own Bayreuth, bereits bereut, as Nietzsche says, remastered, or to be more truthful, my own Sonnenstein, or even more precisely, my own asylum at Endenisch, where I had accompanied Robert Schumann. Here in Strasbourg, my year of teen passion, we gathered for the first time Paul Demann, Sam Weber, Hamacher, Ezer, the foreboding Jaus, and Derrida, and dozens upon dozens of figures and proper names that would become a kinship network, maybe a community without community, certainly without communion. I had already hooked up with Larry, my primal community. <laughs> but what happened at Bayreuth, Sonnenstein, Endenisch, Strasbourg was destinal in another way if not to speak with Derrida, destinaring. Ever since the first encounter with Friedrich's voice, I was put on the Hölderlinian eccentric path, modulating medi mediations and media. Let us meditate and remember. I call upon your assist, mother of the muses. Friedrich was young, beautiful, flowing long hair, and sing-songing through his paper on Bettina into the wind. I had never heard such a voice before, lilting and quietly, pianissimo, pianissimo, assertive. He broke through the armor of my ambivalence, the German language, stubbornly resisting transferability, nonetheless joined its musical counterpart, establishing a relation of affinity between music, pianissimo, pianissimo, leise, and the language that had sprung from Friedrich's mouth. His mouth. 
Friedrich's mouth, I tell you. This mouth that spoke to us through covert and wide-ranging broadcast systems, often patching into unconscious registers, typing up unprecedented links, the office space supplanting love, the new secretary takes her post. Ladies, ladies, the catastrophic state when someone began his lecture with meine Damen, yes, with meine Damen und Herren. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, Friedrich Kittler pinpointed the event, the advent of a new syntagm. Ladies and gentlemen, the feminine flooding of office spaces. Type, type, type. Hello, this is your operator speaking. Tap, tap, tap and classrooms filled with girl students reading in the mother tongue. Friedrich, the other Nietzsche, taught girls in his classroom. Meine Damen und Herren, tja, meine Damen. A philologizing mouth connected to note-taking fingers, nimble fingers, tap, tap, tap. Hello, this is your operator speaking. Tap, tap, tap. in the domains under which we come alive or are crushed, eviscerated. He downsized the so-called humanities while driving and rerouting the very possibility of a cognitive circuitry. He squatted in the university system over which he shrewdly ruled, subversive and commanding at once, our Friedrich. On the ground, Mr. Kittler cut deals among different territorial bosses, some of whom are represented here today. What language did we speak? Welche Sprache sprachen wir? Friedrich, I am calling you in our languages, in the codes you taught, according to the tracks of reading that you laid down for us. He was, at the time they say, ein Wunderkind. <laughs> He knew, they say, Faust by heart, but Faust is alive. That was my signal to the Goethe track to sign up with Hitler's network. Years later, after a disastrous translation for hire, he himself translated my Goethe book 
and then left the only copy on the bus. <laughs> we kept on giving each other gifts that seemed destined to dissolve or blow up in our faces. Once on the phone, he, impatient, raised his voice to me. Give up your narcissism. A book is like a Molotov cocktail. Just throw it already. The pin, Avi, has been pulled. Let it go. I stood my ground, refusing to let a piece of shit joke of a translation be published. He yelled. I dug in. Then he said, suddenly, breathless, OK, I'll translate it myself, page for page, breathless.
sonic layers. Tracking the sonic signatures. Friedrich, your mouth, the way language sourced in you, the cigarette craving, the gin, count me in. What else have you got? <clears throat> Santa Barbara, Berkeley, New York City, Bochum, Berlin, count me in. Freiburg, your bedingungslose Liebeserklärung für Heidegger, your profession of unconditional love for Heidegger, count me in, kind of. Your love for love, for the dilemma of forced choice. The way we spoke about love that last time, all day in your apartment, during the taxi ride, and in the restaurant. You said that Lacan said that all love is requited. You were shattered by the girl in your class who repelled you thought your love. The beginning of the end, you said, on the transferential snafu. Situation normal, all fucked up, I offered in American army talk. You offer me your smile. Repelled, how could that have happened? The lockdown and turn off. You said, Lacan said, love was always requited. You were shattered by the girl in your class. Always requited. I saw this quoted in Dracula's legacy. Maybe you tripped over the translation metalliptically. I'm thinking, though, had the translation snapped by calamitous error in translation, Friedrich, and as Heidegger, on whom you bestowed your unconditional love, had said, Heidegger said, Friedrich, that an error in translation could trip us up for 200, maybe 2,000 years, Friedrich, really scarring and digging into the body. Friedrich, I am talking Leib with Husserl, not Körper or exteriority. Heidegger said, remember, wir leben in dem wir leiben. We body in, we body forth, we body live intimately. All love. Requited, Friedrich. I thought, what if Lacan meant, or said rather, or wrote, something like, all love is returned. Returned, Friedrich. Turning the dials may be returned to sender, Friedrich. Or as in one of metaphysics' great turnovers, or the way the envelope in La Lettre Volée is turned inside out like a glove. We turned inside out, Friedrich. Like the discarded glove. We want to return your love. And if there were time, we would replay the jamming of the transferential networks, the worlds that you convoked in the absence of world, in the decline of mention, you always said Leute to unload the metaphysical skin of Menschen. And when Menschen showed up on your scanners, you tended to say so-called Menschen. <laughs> While I was studying strategies for making so-called friends, the performativity of asserting friendship, like making friends, However ill-fated among colleagues, the student body within and without the vampirizing bureaus of our university, I remember your genealogy of the gymnasium. When and where and why um Himmels Willen did the university append a gym? And by the way, thank goodness they did, because I had to build muscle, stress manage, man up, pump irony nearly every day when I got recess and they let me off the leash for a short spell. You, you metabolized anguish differently. 
puff, puff, rock and roll, sip, gulp, sip, gulp, puff, puff. I tried to make friends my way, and you, Friedrich, you jammed the network by breezily making enemies, by your often rapid turnover of friends. Not all, there were lifers, but you oddly drop, dropped and drummed people out. I'm not sure how one does that. I'd like to learn. Others are so overcrowded and alone at once, standing room only in the spectral section. Still others go zero to dick in under 30 seconds and mash up the most sensitive creatures that come to work with them. Enough. Enough of my autobiographical trace. You, Friedrich, brought love and gratitude from all around, yet you also turned many away in your way, creating a whole economy class of those who went sour. So the range of transferential adhesion is wide and large. From the class of psychotic fusionals to the Avenger types ready to come out just about now from cold storage. That in itself is a life story. Quite a feat. And somehow I felt honor bound to mention, if tremulously, that some of us were put on hold a while ago. Others stayed on for the long haul. Still others are poised as Nietzschean friends of the future. I want to express my admiration for the trove of ambivalence you managed to build, a historically necessary turn given the shadows and abysses that you dropped into implacably. Calm. 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 Ein Hauch. I want to return to a moment that others may not underscore. You were, despite all the drab land and soundscapes, the hollow clanging of the technological death drive. Some strange pronouncements and stranger levels of ballistic excitation, you were attached to the idea of beauty. You turned your gaze to the precincts of beauty, of Grecian beauty. Ah, the way he oriented himself toward beauty was part of a deeply felt philosophical move. Your beauty had preceded you, and when you exclaimed, into the wind, Bettina, your hair flowed. One of the projects on my to-do list not only in the sense of the tyranny of Greece over Germany and other angles of Winkelmania, and not only in terms of Hitler's odyssey, his visit with the sirens in an extravagant burst of geo-empiricity, his famous convoy to the Greek Isles, but also I would like to unfold one day the Dionysian starts and fits with which we associate some of Hitler's insight, even the most scientific, the way he pushed off the shores of knowledge. Despite the burden of the literal by which he sometimes became ensnared, Friedrich, when he turned his gaze on Greece and set the GPS to locate the call of the sirens was still inescapably philosophically engaged. He was trying to find something more originary, a lost ground the origin of language and music. He traveled the labyrinth of the ear, understanding only too well the dangers of tracing the call, the calamitous encounter with beauty. But Friedrich, intensely aware of the dangerous merger, also auditioned opera, knowing full well that opera continuously remixes babble always introducing the trauma of separation, a traumatic fissuring that Wagner sought to mute. Warte nur, bald rauschest du auch. Soon you too will sound. Soon you too will noise. and put
pushed, he could kick you over considerable edges. I follow him to the limit of unsayables, dumbly watching the curls of his cigarette smoke spiral upward. He pushed and provoked. He huffed and puffed. Puff, puff. A couple of times, he pushed some of us too far. This too far awaits reflection, its particular articulation and measure. I do not deny that sometimes this start evokes precisely what one needs to be pushed too far. In terms of historical recklessness, we have gone too far. And Friedrich provides the gauge for the hubristic lunge. We world historically went too far. On his analog scale, he pushed too far. Where does this take us? Friedrich, dazzled with Greekness and bravely walked into ancient abysses that appeared to lay in wait for him. Let us not be intimidated. Like the most exceptional of guys, the off the chart kind of guys, he was a guy's guy in many ways. I don't mean guys like me with a big dictation complex, but regular weapon-wielding military engineer Meechin in uniform, goose-bumping kind of guys, mathematically hardened. Well, whatever, this is not my problem, but is it Friedrich's problem that so many guys, or those coded as guys, get off on his work with only a smattering of girly men or girly girls, or only one or two soft butch types? I mean, what's a girl to do? But let me remind us, together with Derrida, on right-wing Hegel and Marx, and Nazi Nietzsche, and Rickles on Nazi psych, that one is and is not responsible for pulling one's legacy in this or that direction. Friedrich, as I said, was all over what is called women and watched them closely as what is called women reconfigured the philosophical alleyways, pulling and putting the nail in the coffin of a certain phallogocentrism. Like so many culturally pumped guys, he rode the Greeks hard, even in his most rock and roll fugues. The Greek gods, their endless rap sheet of transgression, were his screensaver, always on standby, staring out at him. One of the paradoxes of Kittler's Lebenlauf, Lebenslauf, his CV, remains the babe magnet sector. His work trained on women, but somehow, for the most part and parts, called up the men folk into the wind. Bettina. Into the office, Lois Lane. Into the courtroom, Della Street. On the runway, vamp, vampire, vamplifier. Whether configured in the feminine, or as music, or as language, or all along the Goethe ramp, Beauty ensnared Friedrich in ways that we want to account for, at least partially at this time. In the way he embraced beauty, the way he conducted Eros, Friedrich was Greek. Friedrich, he went after the sirens in the end. He wanted to encounter the extreme limit of possible ex encounter, the destructive edges of desire, tapping an account drawn out by Kafka and Blanchot. Following the call, both piercing and aphonic, our FAK wanted to know the place, if it was a matter of place or placeability even, where the sirens had broken your eardrums, had wept, turned silent. Friedrich Kittler thought he could go there, and he went very far. The time for acute grief, they say, has come to an end. And the time has come to offer reflection. 
I do not customarily se separate off Greek from, from reflection, nor do I separate grief from reflection. But I understand the imperative to get over oneself somehow for the purposes of assuming the stance and responsibility of thinking, of offering hospitality to the work and person of our friend and teacher, whom we will not cease to address. Friedrich studied and commanded the university in unprecedented ways. It's not only his work or how he worked it that compels our attention, but also the way he worked through or precisely refused to so-called work through the more lacerating motifs and disastrous commitments of our time, which since Heidegger, whom Hitler loved unconditionally, involves the university, its peculiar language and housing projects, Friedrich, he skated over an abyss, never afraid to look down, lose his balance, take a fall, come up and go down, or go for broke. According to all sorts of secret and felt velocities, he is and remains our breath, a breath of fresh air. Nimrod Reitmann, uh, Lindsay Zakharov, and Tycho Horan. Thank you so much. Um, you set the tone uh, for the next uh, few days. Uh, welcome to um, the Sirens Go Silent, um, a commemorative colloquium for uh, Friedrich um, Kittler. Um, we are here at the opening night. That means we have two more, two more days to come with, um, with amazing talks uh, to come. And I want to um, especially welcome um, all our speakers, uh, all together 12 speakers who have come from um, Germany, who have come from um, Denver, um, who have come from uh, um, all over the place here um, in the US. And, uh, um, and they will give uh, a few talks uh, tomorrow, seven talks all together. You can uh, look into the programs. Uh, they are um, at the entrance door, I believe. Um, please join us uh, for the next couple of days. I would like to use this um, occasion um, now just like to briefly um, thank all the people and all the organizations who have uh, made, this, uh, made this event even possible and without which it would have never been uh, possible to organize this. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Deutsches Haus and uh, Martin Rauchbauer and Juliane Kempfield um, for their hospitality and uh, for uh, their partnership in planning this um, event. There have been um, two organizations um, our partner organizations uh, for this event who makes this a very, very special event. Um, and some part of the performance already uh, linked us like, into this direction. Um, the connect to make the connection between um, Greek culture, Hellenic culture, and uh, German culture, and uh, to bring us together here on American soil. Um, we have worked together and uh, as partners um, with the Goethe Institute um, New York, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Christoph Bartmann, Sarah Stevenson, and uh, Birger, uh, Wenzel Bilger, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and I would like to, to thank the Onassis Culture Center New York and uh, Amaya Cosmeta too, and uh, Ambassador Lukas Zilas. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so all together, I want to thank Deutsches Haus, the Onassis Culture Center New York, and, uh, um, and the Goethe Institute. Um, this event has then further been supported by a few other organizations, by the DRD, the Humanities Initiative uh, at NYU, the Dean for the Humanities, the Department of Media, Culture and Communication at NYU, and Alex Galloway himself just like uh, contributed some of his uh, research fund uh, to this event, um, and by the Vice Provost for Arts, Humanities and Multicultural Affairs, um, our own uh, German department, Uli Baer. Thank you. And I want to mention our Avital's and mine uh, home institution, the German department, um, particularly um, Eckhard Goebel, the chair of the German department who um, trusted us in getting this done, and of course um, our administrator, Lindsay O'Connor. I personally want to thank Avital for this uh, am amazing experience to work together with you, and uh, I would like to give uh, 
the microphone now just like to Christoph Bartmann, who uh, is the director of the Goethe Institute and, uh, and uh, was on board here even before I came on board, I believe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Arne. Um, good evening. When um, Avital told me a little over a year ago that she planned to organize a conference in honor of Friedrich Kittler, I was immediately enthusiastic and committed to our support. What else? Kittler was definitely one of the most fascinating figures of German uh, humanities, uh, Kulturwissenschaften, or even Geisteswissenschaften. Uh, fascinating, yet controversial. On the other hand, the un unanimous respect and admiration in almost any article written in memoriam of Kittler one and a half year ago, stand in a slight opposition to Kittler's earlier dissident or renegade status. Did history perhaps agree with Kittler after all? But which history? Which Kittler? What kind of agreement? Anyhow, one cannot really imagine literary and cultural studies, media history and media theory in Germany and perhaps even beyond without Kittler. My immediate enthusiasm for Avital's idea, of course, also had personal reasons. As a former student of Germanistic, I could not get past Kittler, beginning with the psychoanalytically informed hermeneutics of his early years. But one can open almost any of Kittler's text at any random passage to be enraptured by the audacity of his thought and style. I faintly remember sentences like, quote, Wer tagsüber technische Schriften schreibt und nachts zwei, drei Anwenderroutinen seiner Grafikmaschine optimiert. So, I forgot the end. But the sound was new, at least in the era of the Commodore 64. <laughs> Tonight and for the next two days, we come together for The Sirens Go Silent, a colloquium with renowned researchers whom each in their own way continue to work on Kittlerian ground. This is not an event to promote Kittlerism, I guess, but one that will survey and draw upon the undoubtedly enormous legacy of this man. I look forward to this conference, and I'm thankful that, as one of many partners, we were able to contribute to it. And we hope to see many of you in our Saturday night Kittler party in the Goethe Institute's Wyoming building. Thank you. Thank you.